All right, welcome back to Form Check Friday. Yay, another Friday, another Form Check. <laughs> this one is just uh, just Bryson, Bryce and I. Dylan's bubbling over with excitement. We were trying to get Danny on, but she's a little bit too busy, mm -hmm. Coach Danny. So we will have her on here soon, yeah. very soon. So just bear with us. You just you have <clears throat> this guy. Yeah, you just got to put up with me, I guess. <laughs> so. Yeah, this uh, series, for those who don't know, we're gonna take your videos, we're gonna look at them, offer you some lifting technique advice, maybe get into some of the programming theory or psychological barriers you might be running into and try to help y'all lift more weight. If you're interested in submitting, check out the description box below. There's a link there or head to calvarybarbell.com and you can get your submission in that away. But who's our first submission today, Dylan? Who do we have here? First submission is Brandon. Brandon. <laughs> Not Brandon. 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 This is All a right, squat, Brandon. obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to summarize and just kind of jump to what he's struggling with. So okay. he's struggling with a sloppy walkout slash happy feet. Okay. His depth is inefficient, is what he says. All right. Um, can we see that? Yep. I mean, that looks like depth to me. Yeah, he's hitting depth. But what else? Keep keep, uh, right. keep the facts coming. His heels are leaving the ground at completion of the walkout, and he's not sure if that's illegal. And those are kind of the three mm. things that he's I see, I see. touching on. All right, so first and foremost here, Brandon, uh, with the walkout, that's just going to be a, a skill and a practice thing. If you're mindful of, you know, taking a few less steps through your walkout and you practice it that way and you're intentional with it each and every time you do a set of squats, that's gonna come together. There's no real cue or, or magic technique or anything like that. You wanna make sure that first and foremost, you're set under the bar really, really tight, that you're getting, you know, a full brace going on, you're picking up the bar, you're not losing the brace. And then we're taking one step back, two steps back, and then maybe adjust for width, toes, and go. So, in terms of the walkout, you know, that's, that's what I would recommend. I think there are a few issues with the squat here. I think, number one, I would probably try to get you into a bit more of a lower bar position because I think for you to progress your squat, you're gonna to wanna to learn how to get a little bit more lean out of yourself. Now, between the, the depth and you know being on the toes quite a bit, those are really indicative of the fact that we're, we're very knees forward, we're not really sitting back at all, we're not using a lot of the posterior chain. Again, that's something that we see with this really sort of exaggerated sticking point right there is a lot of times when people are, th are focusing on being too upright and not allowing themselves to, to be back on the heels, to, for the hips to be back at all, uh, you kind of come into a really nasty sort of leverage disadvantage right there. So, I mean, if this is the only way you can squat is in this kind of like high bar, super upright position, then, you know, pause squats and, and maybe some tempo work help you build through that. But, what I would actually recommend is, is taking a bit of a step back and trying to learn the low bar squat. Because right now you get the bar really high up on your back, right? Which means this lever of the trunk is quite long. If we get that bar down a little bit, there we go. Then we're gonna shorten that lever. And also it's gonna, it's gonna require you to lean a little bit more. And I think I'd say this probably every time I critique a squat on here, but we're also pretty extended, right? I want you to learn how to brace with a little more ribs down so you allow yourself to lean. Again, this real sort of extended brace often coincides with this specific sticking point right there where things almost come to a dead stop because out of the bottom, you're focusing more on like driving your chest up and trying to maintain position than you are on actually being able to push with your lower body. So. Let's work on trying to find that low bar position and get the bar somewhere where it's, it's comfortable, right? We don't want it to be super low. We don't want your elbows and wrists to be in agony. We want you to be able to have the weight of the bar on your back and not feeling like it's falling off, but 
we want to encourage you to start even with a little bit of a lean so that bar is going to be pulling down into your back whereas if we're too upright yeah i mean the bar's going to fall off right so once we get that bar a little lower the next thing i want you to do is learn how to hinge a little into the squat because if we watch how you're initiating this squat right now it's just very knees forward. You're doing everything in your power to stay as upright as possible. I want you to learn to actually, once we get that brace set, to let your trunk hinge, to keep some weight on those heels as you descend, and to get back into your hips and hamstrings a little bit more, which is gonna help smooth out that sticking point, and is gonna keep you from being really far on your toes. Now, in terms of actually coming onto your toes like that, if you were to do that in a meet, yeah, I mean, I, I don't see any issue with it unless your foot actually moves. If your foot actually moves before you get the rack command, you can get called for it, but your foot lifting, I'm pretty sure cannot, you know, there, there's not gonna be many judges who are gonna count that as foot movement uh, and, and red light you for it. Now, that being said, if we're ending up on our tippy toes at the end of a max effort squat, the odds of you maintaining your balance and being in control of it so that you can get, you know, into the rack safely are going to be lower. So obviously if we can, if we can get away from that, that's going to help. And I think that again, the biggest way to do that is a little bit of a lower bar position, get a bit more ribs down brace. You know, I think getting a lower bar position is going to help you get more out of your upper back as well. We're, we're really, you know, I, I think we need to do a better job of pulling those shoulder blades down and pulling the elbows in towards the sides as part of the brace as well. All right, who's next, Dill? Next Lay up. on me, man. Next up, we have Lewis. Tell me about tell me about Lewis here, Dylan. Tell me about Lewis's bench press. What do you got? <laughs> Give me those deets. Uh, Lewis deets has those. been trying to get past 100 kilos for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, he's not really sure if it's just like a mental barrier or what. So he's just wondering like if you see anything and maybe what he can do in his training to get past that 100 kilos. Okay. So first thing uh, when it comes to any sort of plateau is to look at programming, right? Make sure that your program makes sense. Make sure it's set up in a way to allow for progression. Make sure it's set up in a way to have some fluctuation to account for you know fatigue accumulation and for recovery and that there's a balance of those kinds of things. If you're looking for a whole bunch of good programs as well as consistent technique and programming advice from myself and the other fantastic coaches at Calgary Barbell, you can head to calgarybarbell.com and go to the app. There are just about 50 programs in there. The number of programs is growing steadily and you get access to our private Discord community where we do form checks like this every week. So check that out. There's also a seven day free trial. So why not hop in, you know? Um, if you can ascertain that the programming, you know, is not the option or not, is not the issue. And generally speaking, you know, even with suboptimal technique to a pretty significant degree, you should be able to get the bench moving from a programming standpoint. But there are a few things I see here technique wise that I think we can work on. Now the descent here actually looks great. I think <clears throat> from unrack to descent looks really good. We can get a little more leg drive consistency. Once you set the butt down there, I think we're kind of relaxing the legs a little bit more than I would like, but that much of the movement, great. Don't change a thing. Looks wonderful. Good touch point. We got a good angle of the forearm here. Everything's looking good and stacked. But what happens is as we press, we're losing upper back and shoulder blade position. So you can see the everything kind of come back with that bar. So a couple things here. Number one, this pause was kind of short. So I want to say that probably introducing some longer pause variations, um, you know, maybe pausing more consistently in your uh, in your in your comp lifts. Also, I'm just noticing. I think this is Das Strength in Austria, uh, or Das Gym, sorry, which is an amazing, amazing gym. Um, Shoutouts to uh, to Alex and I forget his brother's name, the Perzels. Anyways, um, I think that making sure that your upper back is maintaining position as you initiate the press should be paramount, right? 
Make sure that as you start the press, you're driving your chest up. Make sure that as you start the press, you're squeezing your upper back super tight. And even if that bar comes off your chest the littlest bit slower, maintaining position so that you're in a better position throughout the rest of the lift is worth it, right? You look at Olympic lifting and, and the whole first pull of the movement uh, in, in the snatch or the clean and jerk is all about being in a good position for the second pull, right? It's all about setting yourself up so that when you're, you know, at your most mechanically disadvantaged, that you're in a good spot to get through the hardest part of the lift. So a couple ways, you know, that I would recommend getting that to do, you know, being able to do that better. Like I said, long pause, pausing your comp work longer. Another way that I, I try to tackle that would be doing some upper back work that's relatively specific to the bench. So I really like a, a wider grip seated row on a straight bar, mimic your bench grip, and pull to where your bench is gonna to touch and try to almost pause at the end of the range of motion. Squeeze your upper back and get that same position you would have when the bar is on your chest. And usually when I'm trying to tackle this specific sort of uh, issue, I'm gonna program that in higher reps, probably 12 to 15, maybe some short rests, maybe myo reps, things like that. So we're trying to drive a little bit of that sort of strength, endurance, muscular endurance, when it comes to holding those positions in the bench and in the upper back. Now, the other thing that's really gonna help is like I mentioned, the leg drive, right? If the legs are pushing up this way, the friction of your t-shirt and your back and the weight bearing down into it and the bench is gonna help keep that down, right? So if the top of the majority of your body is pushing back, this friction point here should help keep those shoulder blades down if the legs are doing what we want them to do. So some things that we can cue, you know, in terms of chest up, a little bit of patience off the chest, make sure that position is, is kind of the first thing you're thinking about as you initiate the press. Also leg drive, also programming probably. And finally, we can tackle the upper back with some assistance exercises that are a little bit specific to what we're trying to get out of it. Number three, Dylan, hit me. Number three is Clark. I think that's pronounced Claire. Claire. Clark or Clark, I mean, you know, tomato, tomato. Clark. Looking for your thoughts on where my technique breaks down. Okay. Uh, Clark thinks it's his upper back hmm. being like the weakest link, mm -hmm. but want, mm -hmm. doesn't want to like focus on it until he sees what you think might be his weakness. Interesting. Also, okay. so he competes in strongman. Right. And he's finding that strapping up is harder than doing just like uh, over okay, under grip. Okay. So he's, but he has to use straps because in events you're doing it for reps. So he's wondering if you have advice for like getting a good brace while strapping up. Mm -hmm. So a couple things. Let's start at the start. So the lift itself. And I think, yes, I think we are seeing a little bit of breakdown in the upper back, but it might not be what you think it is. I don't think it's the amount of flexion like I think this back position and back angle is great and totally fine. What I think it is, is the maintaining of, of your shoulder position and tightness of the lats. Because I think what's happening is as you're initiating the lift, you can see we kind of get pulled forward and rounded out in the shoulders, not in the back. So if we want to allow this little bit of protraction or forward tracking in the shoulder blades, that's fine but we need more depression. We need the shoulder blades pulled down more. Effectively, you know, like I was talking about earlier, shortening the lever of the back, right? If we can get those shoulder blades pulled down, get those lats a little, little tighter off the floor so that bar isn't pulling you out of position as you initiate, right? Let me just wash that again. You can see that just slight little bit of lost position in the upper back. It's coming from the shoulders. It's coming from the lats. So we tighten the lats up, and that way, when we pull into this position, that's more similar to where we're starting to pull from instead of out here. Now, secondly, I noticed that you're a top-down setup lifter, right? So you very much just like go down, grab the bar and go. And, and maybe you're not so much top-down in terms of, I don't think we're getting quite a full brace at the top before we approach the bar. But my recommendation would be to see if you can get some kind of like 
quick strap kind of thing. And I'm pretty sure in Strongman, like, like anything goes. So you might be able to get some like Versa grips um, that are like a flap or a hook or something that come off the wrist. And then you can set up as normal, kind of get that little bit of brace that you do, and then go down, grab the bar and go. Because I think what's probably messing you up is the fact that you have to be bent over and down there on the bar, you know, trying to, to get your grip set for a couple of seconds at least before you're able to kind of pull your hips in. And the, the, the sequence that I'm seeing here is different than that, right? This sequence is very much, as Dylan likes to say, grip it and rip it. Oh yeah. That's Dylan's favorite oh, saying. Oh yeah. Um, and I think with straps, that really disrupts that usual kind of approach. So if that's not an option for whatever reason, then I would say just start doing more of your lifting with straps, right? Even if it feels worse at first, you will find ways to kind of figure it out. Um, and I think the biggest one is gonna be, you know, maybe just trying to stay as far from this position while setting your straps as possible. So you'll see some strongmen like kneel down to set their straps and then they'll stand up, then they'll pull. Or start with your hips really high and like way out of position so that once the straps are set, you can, you can pull in and have that little bit of like stretch reflex, that little bit of, of sort of preload as you pull in, right? Because it looks like you like to pull in relatively quickly, pull the slack and go. You don't seem to want to spend a lot of time there, which is fine. I think that's a, a fine strategy, but I think that's what I'm gonna see here or, or pick out as probably the biggest difference between your strapped deadlifts and your, you know, normal over under. The other thing is, if it's a difference of double overhand feeling uncomfortable, you can strap with one hand under, right? Like nothing says you can't, unless of course there's some weird rule in Strongman I don't know about. But, you know, if that's the difference and you're used to pulling with that left hand under, and going over is what sort of throws you off. You just strap under. So, yeah. Hopefully that helps, Clark. Hopefully that helps. Hopefully that helps. Next up. Sean. Or seen. Or seen. Could be seen. <laughs> yep. Cyan. 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 Uh, <laughs> Cyan, like the color. Sean is. We'll go with. We'll go with Sean. We'll for go now. with Sean. Uh, I, think, I think it's probably Sean. He's <laughs> happy with his squat technique. But as the weights get heavier, his walkout feels really hard mm -hmm. and his, he's struggling to, I guess, keep his upper body um, feeling tight. Okay. So he's wondering like what he should do to work on that because he feels like his legs can handle more weight, but his core can't. All right. So looking at this lockout and I, I kind of wish you would have given me more of the walkout and more of the setup if this was the issue right but I think I can see enough so if we watch this just like first couple seconds as you pick up the bar right number one you pick it up and that bar is like wobbling around on you wait a second what's up are those knee sleeves backwards they are hmm huh. that's interesting yeah anyways when you pick up the bar, it's it's not locked into your back. So what I want you to do is, is maybe take these hooks down one, right? Because it looks like we got pretty good hole spacing here, right? So if you, if you take these hooks down one, you won't need to stand it up quite as high. And I think that might be part of, even subconsciously, why we're a little loose is because you're like, well, I gotta get out, I gotta, I gotta shrug up, I gotta get it over these hooks. So I think that's part of, of what's messing you up. The other thing is we just got to see, we got to get way more set before we pick the bar up. One of the biggest things I see people do is, you know, if, we, if we're looking at this from the side and this is the bar, I see lifters set up with their feet back here. So they're having to like basically do a good morning and pick with, you know, their back as opposed to their hips. So if this is the plates, we wanna be here and feet right under the bar so that you're picking with your hips straight up and then able to walk out. Because if that bar's out in front of you when you pick up, like you're gonna be on your toes, you're not gonna feel very secure through your brace at all. Now, the other thing that I'm noticing here is we have this really narrow grip. 
and I wonder if we made a, a short about this, um, but I have this this kind of like pet concept that I've been developing and thinking about, and that is that there's there's sort of false tightness or or uh, passive tightness, and then there's active tightness. And when we cram everything in really tight and really close, I should say, when we cram everything in really close here, we create this passive tightness, right? We have to bunch the shoulder blades up. We have to get the elbows and, and arms in really close to the body. But if we're wedged too close in here, we maybe don't have the room to be as actively tight as we would wanna be. So I would challenge you to potentially, you know, come out to, to maybe pinkies on the rings and really work on trying to find active tightness to where when you put yourself in a position under the bar, you're not already tight, you have to get tight. And it's the act of getting tight and producing that tightness that I think is gonna make a big change for you there. Because if you pick up the bar and it's like wobbling already, we're not tight enough. The other thing is, if that bar isn't settled, number one, you can put it back, you can pick again if it feels like crap on your back, put it back, reset, get tighter, do it better. Or number two, just wait a sec for it to settle before you start walking out, right? It does look like that bar's still a little bit in motion. We're still a little unstable. And then we start taking these, these kind of like quick steps back. Don't rush your wash out, your wash out, your walk out. I want you to pick up, make sure that bar's set, and then consciously, maybe even verging on slowly, step back to set your position under the bar. I think in terms of the squat, I think you're right. Like you, you do squat really well. Again, this is another thing I often try to advise lifters against, this little shrug here. Like if you're doing your, your job properly, getting the bar out of the rack, then you're already gonna be locked in, rib cage locked down, lats locked down, everything super tight. The last thing we wanna do is start getting out of that position and setting it again, right? We wanna have that consistency from walkout into the start of the squat. So this like shrug thing there, I think is probably setting you back as well. If, it, you know, if the issue is the upper body and maintaining upper body tightness, then we gotta get the body tighter before we unrack. We gotta keep it tighter, you know, between every single rep, because you're, you're doing the shrug thing between every rep. You're getting to the top and yeah, that bar is like wiggling and moving around on you. So again, I think learning to set that upper back and shelf better out of the rack and then keeping it way more consistent throughout the set. Because it looks like every time you get up to the top, you're kind of just relaxing that upper back. And this is where I think that active passive tightness thing comes into play, you know, pretty strongly is because you feel tight because you're just kind of wedged in there. You get to the top and there's no like contraction. So your arms and shoulders and everything are wiggling around as opposed to being pulled in down towards your sides, you know, trying to find that shoulder blade depression and that upper back tightness that we have throughout the squat, but getting to the point where we can produce it earlier and more consistently and where we can maintain it throughout the set. So again, hope that helps, Sean. This is our final submission. Huh? Final guest of the day. This is Michael or <laughs> or Michael. Hard to say, honestly. I mean, I don't want to be the one determining how to say people's names. So I just like to leave it open ended. Michael. You know, here are the options. Uh, deadlift hasn't increased for a year, despite squats and lower body lifts getting stronger. Okay. His friends are saying his deadlift form are, is not optimal because his knees lock out too early. I don't know what to do. How I pull just feels strong and natural, but I'm at a brick wall and can't lock out anything heavier than 545. All right. So number one, we need to learn how to brace. We're, we're really not, we're just kind of like not bothering with bracing. You're snapping into it and then you can see. That, see, that's what I would call Ripping it, ripping it. <laughs> this, this is really <laughs> ripping it, yeah. You can see, yeah, the hips shoot up and maybe that's kind of what your friends are saying with the knees extending a bit early. But because we're not braced at all through the trunk or the lats or, or any of that, we're just, we're losing so much force off the bottom and ending up in such a worse position than we could be. 
right? You can see like the upper body picks the bar and then actually dips as you pull. Like your upper body gets further forward as you pull. I'm gonna guess this is probably a case of like, you gotta just peel the weight back a little bit, you know, try to try to just, just set the ego aside for a bit. Work on trying to find a, a better start position where you're getting like a little bit more tightness through the upper back. Cause right now your shoulders are just like elevated, protracted, whatever, doesn't matter. Just like not in any position. Um, which means, right, we get to here and then we just have a whole lot of back extension to get through at the top. So you're gonna be really limited by what you can kind of slam your back through on. If you can get to the point where you learn to use your trunk and, and upper back better in the deadlift, it's gonna go a long ways for you. And I think another way of doing this is probably gonna be getting your hips a little further back behind you, knees a little further back behind you and trying to find a more neutral back position. Now I'm not somebody who's like, oh yeah, you know, you need to have a perfectly flat back or else. But I do think we could get a fair bit more neutral than this. Find a position where we're actually able to like use our glutes and hamstrings throughout the lift because right now we're really wedging in we're getting a lot of quads and you know then we're, we're, we're just using quads and back pretty much here so we got to find a way where we can get some posterior chain that's probably going to be you know flattening the back out a little bit hips a little higher and behind you um you know likely working on some top end stuff in terms of you know uh stiff legged deadlifts rdls all that kind of stuff and probably not going for a max effort deadlift for like four to six months don't I, ch I challenge you to not max out for four to six months get some some intelligently designed programming you know peel back the weight if you're if your max is five what do you say 45 yeah if your max is 545 pulling like this pull your max back to like 495 or 485 Learn to pull with a little bit more intent. Work on figuring out bracing. Train your upper back and your glutes and your hinge pattern really hard on top of all that. And lastly, stop dropping the bar like that. You can go ahead and toss it down. And, and I do this sometimes. And when I do it, I call it the douche toss. I like bench the bar back into the ground. I've done it before. Sometimes you get real revved up and you're proud of yourself and that's good. And you should, you should live in that moment. But if you ever, ever, ever want to compete or even think about competing, never drop the bar from here, right? You always want to keep your hands on the bar all the way down. I don't care how loud it is. I don't care how much noise it makes. You just have to keep your hands on the bar because that's a powerlifting thing. Right, that's, that's one of the rules of powerlifting. And if you ever did compete, I would hate for you to push through a rep like this, be stoked and happy for yourself that you did it, be proud and then throw it down and get three red, red lights, right? So just, just keep your hands on the bar as, as sort of a final, final touch there. But um, yeah, I wish you all the luck. I think if you can, you know, do all of these things that I'm mentioning here, like you look like a young guy probably like in your 20s maybe even younger I was gonna say like 13 but <laughs> I don't know about 13. <laughs> but in any case like I didn't do deadlifts until I was like 23 and I've pulled world records so if you're in your early 20s and you're strong enough to pull 545 if you can dedicate yourself and you know have the the process orientation and the long-term view on your lifting to dial it back, to be conscious, to, to approach this with some, some methodology and some thoughtfulness and intent, I think you could get to the point where you're pulling, you know, six, 700 pounds in a couple of years, without a doubt. It's just a matter of like, can you take the necessary steps back in order to get forwards as much as you might want, so. That's, that's what I'd recommend. That's my thoughts. That's my advice for you, Michael. And 
I hope you have all enjoyed Form Check Friday. Make sure to tune in if you want to submit. Links down below. And we'll see you in the next one. Bye. Bye.